Sounds were my idea to um, show everyone the cool features that M365 has. These sessions are scheduled at um, six my time, so I'll be enjoying a beer. But as it, as it says, these sessions are called sit and sip. So get a coffee, make sure you get a nice little drink, sit down, and we'll try to have a relaxed talk about these specific features. Today, we're going to zoom in a little bit on autopilot. Um, I'm saying a little bit because autopilot is a pretty complex beast. It's um, everyone always says that um, like autopilot is 1% of Intune. That is absolutely true, but even inside of autopilot, there are still so many ways to go and so many directions to take that it will take you a long time before you understand every little aspect of it. Um, before we get started, I'm going to mention some places where you can get more information when you're really, really wanting to deep dive. Um, first off, it's Rudy Ohms, his blog. I will type his name inside of um, the chat right now because he's another Dutchman. It's kind of weird, weird name. You'll have to Google him. He is the person that is able to understand um, autopilot more than any of us in here. Um, secondly, I would be remiss to not recommend one of my friends' podcast, Lewis. Um, Lewis is in the chat right now. Uh, please feel free to drop your link to your podcast about EMS. Um, Lewis is, is brilliant when it comes to auto, uh, autopilot in tune and everything related to uh, enterprise management solutions. Is that e what EMS stands for? EMS stands for enterprise. I forgot. I forgot. Um, also, um, yeah, call for cloud mobility, enterprise mobility solutions. Um, call for cloud is the blog that I was talking about. That's correct. And Lewis, thank you for dropping the link to your podcast. There's a lot more of these uh, places. There's, a, there's an entire EMS community that you can join, and there's a lot of resources available online specifically dedicated to all of Intune. Autopilot is a tricky beast because it, con it, it contains a lot of, of um, caveats if you want to configure it well, and that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on how you can use SIP to configure your autopilot, the same for all your clients, without dropping into um, the, uh, the, the, the pitfalls that exist everywhere inside of autopilot. So the first thing I'm going to start with is um, I'm going to show you guys um, the autopilot configuration inside of SIP. After that, we're jumping into uh, one of the Microsoft portals and making sure that um, we're setting up autopilot there. So you can also understand how it's supposed to look in the normal portals. Um, I'm first going to start talking about devices, then uh, about um, how to add specific autopilot profiles. Then I'm going to talk to you about ESP, but I'm not going to deep dive too much for that. Uh, ESP are the status pages you, sh you see when using autopilot. Uh, we're also going to uh, zoom in a little on what the difference is between white glove and uh, um, I forgot how it's called inside of the portal, but self-managed autopilot. So you're clicking around. Um, of course, Lewis is going to be out of box. Thank you. Um, Lewis is going to be correcting me most of this pr presentation, I suspect, whenever I make a mistake on one of the many acronyms that we have inside of Intune and Autopilot. All right. So I will now be sharing my SIP screen. And this is our autopilot ad, uh, device wizard inside of SIP. And this is already the part where most of the confusion arises because a lot of people believe that somehow you have to go out and uh, open the machine, get the hash, and that's the only way that you are able to add autopilot devices. That's, that's partly true. That's true if you're not a Microsoft partner, but as all CSPs and MSPs here are a Microsoft partner, you're able to add devices in a much simpler way using partner center APIs. These partner center APIs are the stuff that we're talking to inside of SIP. Now I'm currently clicking on one of our testing tenants inside of our SIP dev environment. Also, a quick note, if you see anything that you don't see in your normal portals inside of this uh, environment, 
please remember that uh, this is my local host development instance. This is very different from the production environment. It also could crash at random moments, these kind of things. I like showing it inside of the development environment because then I can also talk about new surprises that are coming. Okay, so we're selecting a tenant. And at this moment, we're already getting presented with two options. Number one is you can drop a CSV file here. This CSV file can be supplied to you either by your partner. So for example, Ingram Micro, a Synex, um, uh, Arrow, all of these vendors that supply hardware to you. But you can also create this CSV file yourself. There's an example CSV you can download right here. And all you have to do is fill it in. What you have to be careful of when you're doing this stuff is that the CSV is case sensitive and that's because the API is case sensitive. So you can't edit the headers when you're editing stuff. When you're ad adding a device to autopilot, uh, the most common way is the hardware hash. So what most people do is they boot up the device, they start clicking around, they either set it up or they hit shift F F11 or F12 and, or F10 and get the um, uh, executor script to get the hardware hash. That's a pretty convoluted process. Getting the hardware hash is something that is, it, it takes a while. It takes a while before you either have um, the machine booted, uh, get the hardware hash, executed the script and trying to explain this to first line engineers, interns, or techs that are really just getting started, it gets confusing for them. Now, the great thing is that with SIP, using the partner sent APIs, you're able to use different methods. Um, I'll talk about my favorite method first and my second favorite method after. My favorite method is the Windows product key ID. A lot of vendors have started printing this directly on the box when you order a device. For example, Lenovo, Microsoft, um, HP has all started printing this directly on the box. And this product key ID is all you need to add a device to autopilot. Um, sometimes I was about to say that, Travis, sometimes you have vendors that stick the shipping label directly over those serial barcodes and these kind of stuff. Ingram Micro tends to do that too. Um, then you do have to use one of the other methods. But when you have the Windows product key ID, you don't need anything else. You enter the ID right here, you hit the add button and you continue and it's been added to your autopilot environment. The great thing about using the Windows product key ID, and this is actually a very recent change, is that it also makes sure that if you're currently read, if this device is currently registered to another tenant, you're able to find what tenant it's registered to with that ID. That's a bit more complex and something we're building into SIP later on, but there's a method of finding what a device belongs to. Um, there, uh, Preach, I just asked, cause I'm keeping an eye on, on the chat. Um, the product ID inclusion is random. Some will, some won't. Any chance it's on an invoice as well? Um, yes, there is a, uh, um, uh, uh, there is a limit to what manufacturers do and what they don't do. And seemingly, especially with Lenovo, I found that Devices ordered after a specific date do include it. Devices ordered before do not. Um, um, and that is uh, also, you have to remember that these devices sometimes just lay in storage for a couple of months, weeks, years, especially like the Lenovo T-Series. They can be at a, at a vendor for years before the uh, ID was included. All new ordered devices should include it. Um, now we're talking about the next part, which is the combination of manufactured device model and device serial number. Now this one's a little bit more complex because it requires, it requires very exact information. Like the serial number, that's a given. I mean, it, you flip over the device, you find the serial number, but the device manufacturer, now that is a more complex one because HP has decided that their devices can either be created by HP Inc. Their devices can be created by HP, just like that. Their devices can be created by HP, like this. Their devices can be created by Hewlett Packard, still, in some cases. So 
it gets very annoying to guess which is the right one. There's a couple of GitHub repositories that I will be dropping the link of inside of chat right after the presentation that actually have started collecting the model, the device manufacturer, so that you are able to match those exactly as is expected. Um, I believe there's some someone even inside of SIP um, that has started creating this little data of the correct manufacturer, the correct model. Because I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm saying HP, but we're at Dell House, and Dell also has the same. Dell has Dell period, Dell Inc period, Dell without a period. And yeah, it's 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 all, it, it, it all gets very confusing, not even to start about the model numbers, because when you're moving over to Lenovo or something like that, there is no way to get this. An important note is that I just said the hardware hash is hard to get and um, it's um, um, I, I want to say that these two options, the Windows product key ID and the combination of manufactured device model and device serial number are my most favorite options. But there are vendors that simply don't supply them. There are vendors that only supply either the hardware hash or you don't have a choice. Uh, imagine that you have some custom build hardware. We actually have a client that builds their own hardware because they do AI research and they um, can't, they, they, they simply can't. They order a, a very specific motherboard from a very specific manufacturer that has 24 PCI Express slots and or PCIe slots and they have uh, 18 video cards in one machine and these kind of things. So, so it, it becomes very complex to get the hardware hash for that. At those moments, your only option is to indeed run the script. Um, there are some better scripts than the get win autopilot hash uh, running out there. There is one that immediately up uploads it to the correct tenant, so you don't have to use SIP to, to even log in there. There's also some others that um, either collect the information or send it to a central server or, or a central function app, so you can distribute it to the correct tenant yourself. Um, I'll also drop a link to some of those in chat right after. And that's actually the part about the uh, adding a device. Right now, I'm not going to add any device because it's pretty boring. It's imagine a Windows product EID. We click the add button, we click next, and we give it a group name, and we click next, and it's done. It's added. There's nothing very special in that. Um, let's move over to the more fun stuff in autopilot because autopilot isn't just setting up your device as the as the way you want it, but it's also setting it up in the way you want it. There's two different ways of um, doing, um, um, there's two different ways of using autopilot and they use somewhat dated terms, LTI and ZTI. ZTI is zero touch installation and LTI is low touch installation. Um, these are terms that used to be used with SCCM and MDT. And if you don't know what SCCM or MDT is, you should feel very lucky. You should be happy that you don't, and you shouldn't invest any time in researching any of these technologies anymore. Please, please just don't, just don't. Just stick with Autopilot, just use that. You can learn about MDT in the new MD-102 exam. That is correct. They unfortunately still teach data technology. So let's talk about the profiles. Profiles are what um, give Autopilot the instructions on how it's going to execute the out of the box setup. And that is the most accurate and, and shortest description I can give you of that. Although these profiles are actually pretty complex and there's a lot of settings that are somewhat hidden behind these couple of switches because it looks like you're getting a page with just a couple of switches but each of these switches can have a massive impact on your experience so um the profiles are the most powerful part inside of autopilot to decide how your users are going to experience autopilot now let me take a step back again and um, explain the difference between how users experience autopilot and how we experience autopilot because there's multiple ways you can go about this i'm going to explain the way that my msp goes about this and i'm going to explain the way that a, a partner msp that we use goes about this and you can decide which has your own preference so starting with my msp my msp is fairly large but we have always said 
that we want to take everything out of the hands of users. We don't want them to see the autopilot boot up screen. We don't want that. But the reality is that we want to also dropship stuff to our clients. Um, in most cases, we still receive the devices for our clients directly ourselves. We unpack them, we check them for faults, we boot them up and we start the autopilot process. And by starting the autopilot process, it means that we open up the device, add it to autopilot first, open up the device, boot it, and then start the setup. Starting the setup sounds like, oh yeah, he's going to walk through the entire setup right now, where his employees walk through the entire setup, click next, 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 and log in the user. No, we use what's called uh, the white glove system in which we boot up the machine, add it to autopilot and hit the windows key five times. If we hit the windows key five times, what happens is that it actually starts installing all of the applications that have been assigned to the device already. And that means that Windows or Office be gets installed. Um, it receives some policies that are device-based policies. It receives uh, the compliance stuff. It, it receives a whole lot of stuff by right? just by hitting the Windows key five times and getting a little menu on, hey, I want to make sure that this device is ready. That's all we do. At that point, we send the device over to the user. What they do at the moment they receive it is log on using their own credentials and their own accounts. Now. I said, that's what my MSP does. It depends on how your MSP delivers service because a partner MSP of ours does it a little bit different. They actually do perform autopilot fully. What they do is when they receive a new device for a user is they unpack the device, they add it to autopilot and they have autopilot install everything. But they make sure that um, the user that gets the device is completely ready to use the device. And they do that by creating a temporary access password for the user to walk through the entire autopilot process and set everything up for the user entirely. Like I just said before, using my white glove support, um, using my white glove support, I get all the device policies. But sometimes you want all um, the, uh, sometimes you want all the, uh, policies for uh, users as well. And that means you create a temporary access pass. Doing, uh, creating a temporary access pass inside of SIP is going to users. Dun, 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 dun. Just wait a second. Going to users, clicking here and create temporary access password. This temporary access password allows you to log in as the user, bypass MFA temporarily and do everything you can under that user account. Now. You're already get, seeing where I'm going with this. I'm not comfortable with doing stuff on the user accounts. I'm not comfortable with logging in as users at all. So I prevent my help desk from doing this in 99.9% .9 of the cases. We actually send an email to a user when a temporary access pass has been created uh, so that, that they are aware that we are logging in under their account. Um, it depends on your entire comfort level and your service level. If you have clients that are expecting very specific um, um, white glove support. I mean, we have a lot of private equity parties that really want us to do everything for them. We've taught them that that's not always an optimal solution, but still it is a solution to help them set up a device or, or to help have your help desk set up a device. Um, there are some questions in chat, I think. So let me just stop myself right here. Um, and after that, we'll stop for a little commercial break with a tiny little announcement. So I did not uh, see questions. <laughs> I see a question by PJ. Anyone find that even if they got the details to upload and allow for dropshipping to the end users to log on and deploy in demand, the whole welcome to company X doesn't happen and you have to do some manual setup to, to allow them on? Um, yes and no. Um, in most cases, that means that the device really hasn't been prepared for autopilot or it has no network connectivity. It's important that you mention to the users that they either connect it to a docking station, which is what we always tell them to do, or um, make sure that their Wi-Fi is connected before they continue on the out-of-the-box setup. Um, Jabi asked, do you need MFA for temporary access passwords? No, it bypasses MFA and gives the user a strong authentication claim. So that means that a user actually is temporarily logged on with a access pass. 
There is a slight downside to a temporary access pass. The longevity of the access pass also means the longevity of the refresh token, and you cannot get new refresh tokens. So that means you log on. If that pass expires after an hour, it is expired. You do no longer have an MFA claim. You are no longer able to click anywhere inside of the portals and log in with that access pass. Skipped over Frank, though. He had a question, too. Um, it was like situations where apps need to be user-specific. Is the temp access the way you recommend that um if you only want to use uh, or if you you only are able to install specific apps on specific users yes temporary access pass is the solution for that there's a few more on this uh jim barry wanted to know if it disrupted uh user continued use um and frank asked if it works with a hybrid ad join um Jim, no, it does not disrupt the user's uh, continued use. They don't even notice you created the temporary access pass. Um, Frank asks, does temporary access pass work with hybrid AD joint? Um, I'm going to ask Lewis to send a very specific meme, Fra meme Frank. Um, you should never, ever, ever use hybrid AD joint. There is never a good reason to do hybrid, ever. Um, Having a desync and having um, um, uh, Intune in place, yes, absolutely. But hybrid Azure AD joint is is something you should not bring yourself on, no matter the size of the company. Actually, Microsoft is actively recommending not to use it unless you have a very specific cutover. I know why in what situation you're doing this, and you pretty much have no good escape. Um, but yeah, it's. It's it's um, yeah, it's it's not a recommended solution. Um, can you talk a little bit about what Greybeard said? Um, I believe by default you have to enable tap use for Windows login. Um, so there's actually two things that you can do. Number one is using tap for autopilot is simple because it simply asks for the temporary access pass. You can enter it and you can click next. But if you want them to log onto Windows with the temporary access pass, you have to enable web sign-in. That is correct. And that is a policy that is available inside of SIP as well. Uh, it's one of the default policies that we supply. And then Craig wanted to know, does temporary access pass bypass conditional access for session tokens? There's a lot of questions. I'm not sure if you've already answered some of these. That is a good question. Um, for token age, probably. Yes, it bypasses it. Um, for, uh, I have to say this correctly, because it doesn't bypass it. It has a very specific token age set. And because of that, it might bypass your policies if they're less than the age of the temporary access pass. If you are using SIP, the temporary access pass age is one hour. So if you have anything under that, yes. Um, there, there were a lot of questions I noticed here. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jim Perry asked, does it work or with uh, Imibot for rolling out user specific stuff? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can use Intune and Imibot at the same time. Uh, Darren has a couple of very cool use cases in which both are very useful. Um, while of course he prefers you to use Imibot for everything and why not if you have it available. Um, Alden asked, what is the alternative if I don't want on-prem devices and intra registered? Um, Lewis just sent the perfect link. Read that, please. Um, that that is um, pretty much everything that that uh, um, um, you should know about hybrid join, AD join, and these kind of things. It it really is a good article. Um, I'm very glad that Boots is in this presentation because he would have gone ham and started cursing at everyone for wanting to use um, hybrid join. <laughs> um, and then Frank asked, have you seen an issue with white glove OBE when you are on Wi-Fi versus LAN connected? Last time he said OBE, he meant one, and but I said OBE, so I'm assuming he actually meant case, that this in time. This, <laughs> in this case, out of the box meta, <laughs> out of the box experience. Um, 
No, I haven't. Um, but that's also because the moment that we autopilot devices, they're connected to a different Wi-Fi network, which only has a direct connection to the internet, not the rest of the LAN. So it's it might be different in your environment. It might be limitations on Wi-Fi. It might be anything, but we can always figure that out together. If you want to take a moment, Frank, and see what's happening, I can um, just check uh, check with you. And I mean, we can have a good time. A couple of beers, right? I've almost scrolled down to the bottom. Um, Bobby asked, FS Logics RDS servers MS documentation recommends hybrid join to fix AAD broker tokens not working when mobbing from server to server. In, is that the case you mentioned? Yes, that is indeed one of the cases that I mentioned. Um, you, you almost have no other solution at this moment. Um, using FS Logics locally is help. That is that is the most accurate description. Uh, Steven said that he'll fill in for boots. <laughs> yeah, and I've and scrolled VDI to the bottom. Ex exactly, Frank. <laughs> okay. All right. Perfect. Um, all right. So I said that I have a little announcement, and it's actually exactly halfway through. So um, how about we stop for a little commercial break, everyone? No. Okay. Go for it. There's the one that wants to stop for a commercial break. Okay, so we have a little announcement, and this is the first place that I'm publicly saying this, and um, I'm actually like going to be a little bit careful um, because um, I agreed with the specific vendor to not start marketing this until it's public, um, until it's officially public. We have a new sponsor. Well, we actually have a sponsor that increased their sponsorship, and um, with that, created something amazing. And this is a small enough group where I feel confident enough to say it. And Luke is already panicking a little because we agreed to not have any marketing going out. I would like to announce that um, Ninja One has increased their sponsorship to the level of extension sponsor. And there is a giant new um, 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 logo right here at the bottom. Let me actually turn to light mode. We're making sure that uh, this logo will also show up better in, in light mode. Where we now have Ninja One as a sponsor, but that's not all guys. We have the application settings. Who this is, this is terrible, isn't it? The light mode, look at actually like how it changed the color on my face. Look at this new place in our extension settings where we have a Ninja One integration available. Um, this integration actually uh, is being rolled out tomorrow, starting in Europe and then coming the next couple of weeks, where it will directly integrate into Ninja One, giving you the ability to um, seek compliance settings, uh, to alert on compliance and a lot more cool stuff. Ninja One will be able to uh, influence SIP. SIP will be able to influence Ninja One. You're able to uh, see a lot of talent information in Ninja One. For more information, I'm going to have to ask you all to wait until we actually do our public uh, uh, release. Um, we're also going to uh, have a couple of videos around that. Uh, Ninja, uh, Ninja One requires you to have a specific version. Starts rolling out tomorrow, version 5.6. 5 and it uh, allows you even to document specific tenant set settings directly into Ninja One, including your users and all of that kind of stuff. So enjoy that. And that was our sponsor sponsored break. Look at that, How what a difference it is when you go back to dark mode. It is beautiful, isn't it? Okay, back to our regularly ske scheduled program. Exactly, Frank. Um, we're going to click on uh, autopilot and add our profile. Now, I was talking about all the options inside of the profile. <laughs> um, the profile itself in SIP allows you to only deploy a single profile. And that is because I am very convinced in the process, personally very convinced. And we all know that SIP is opinionated software and it has my opinion. I'm very convin convinced that everyone only needs one profile when configured correctly. And that means that we change the default profile that is available inside of um, uh, M365 and Intune right now. Now, all of these settings have a little bit of complexity involved with them. 
Number one is convert all targeted devices to autopilot, means that every device that falls in this category eventually goes into, um, 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 an auto, uh, eventually gets added to an autopilot device. I'm saying eventually because it's not instant. It's not something that just you turn it on and every device is instantly added. It takes a while before they all get applied. Assigned to all devices speaks for itself. Self-deploying mode is what I've explained before. There's a difference between uh, the user clicking on next, 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 and everything getting deployed for them. Self-deploying mode does most of the work for them. And of course, the standard functionality that you've already had um, 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 with, in, with um, I have to say this correctly, with MDT or SCCM or um, what was that called? Um, Autoattended.xml, something like that. Autoattended.xml, where you could stick in a USB stick with a specific XML file and you could hide specific things. That's exactly the same as um, um, as uh, that's exactly the same as those previous settings. Now, this is actually a very cool setting. Um, set up user as a standard user. This is very, very important. People, please do not allow your users to be local admin. Just make sure that this one is enabled. It's enabled by default for a reason. You don't need local admins anymore. You just don't. Like the moment that you believe you need a local admin, I am ready and to, to be standing behind you and prove you wrong. Like I will take the trip over to you and explain to you that it's wrong. You don't need to be a local admin. <laughs> uh, Gary just said, if you allow your users local admin, your SIP instance gets deleted uh, and you're locked out of your tenant. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that, that's going to be a new rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> Frank says that I live in a so world where uh, no one uses legacy software. Actually, I live in a world where legacy software is very prevalent. But we take very, very strong measures to make sure that the legacy software doesn't run our security procedures. Um, we either make sure that they don't need local admin access by uh, tricking the vendor. Uh, we simply use something, well, simply, we use something like Process Monitor to see exactly what's, what paths they, they access as a local admin, give everyone permissions that they need on there, and then eventually give them permissions, uh, and then eventually try the app again, remove their admin permissions, see what happens. It, it goes pretty far in what you can do and what you can do. Um, there are cases, um, the local QuickBooks uh, exact, um, yeah, there are cases where you simply can go around it and you need specific tooling for it. Microsoft tooling, for example, where they recently released their own elevation product for E5 sub subscribers. You're able to use that now, even though it's locked behind like the highest license ever. Okay, um, then uh, allow the white glove out of the box experience. Now, this is the one that I was talking about with hitting the Windows key five times. Make sure that um, you can you can uh, uh, enable this and use it even if you don't do it, even if you don't. And uh, automatically configure the keyboard. Also, please enable this because, you know, there's international internationalization, all that kind of stuff. You want this to be enabled. It just makes it easier. And when, as you can see, you can deploy this through SIP, same way as you deploy everything else. Now we're going to check the add status page option because the status page is something that a lot of people get confused at. There's actually um, a couple of policies that suggest that, um, oh, I thought EPM was included in E5, or you can only purchase it when you have, or yeah, the Intune Premium Suite, something like that. It's, it's Microsoft and licensing, they get a bit silly, trust me. It's going to get better sometime, ever. Okay, so the status page. There's a couple of confusions that exist around the status page because the status page is the thing that blocks most people from working. And there is actually two things that you have to remember. There is not just one status page. There is actually two. There is the device ESP and the user ESP. Secretly, there's a bit more, but let's focus on these two right now because we're not doing a direct deep dive on everything. 
the user page is the or the device page is the one you cannot avoid it's the one where it says hey i'm registering this device with intune i'm registering this device for uh, device management i'm uh, installing the device applications there's no way around that one there's no way around that one that um, doesn't involve um, not giving users um, what they need to have this part about the esp um, gives users the options in the device ESP or the user ESP. Um, you can show the progress to them or you can decide not to do it. You can turn on law collection. You can show the status page only when out of the box is run. Um, out of the box setup is different from your normal setup, but the status page can also show up when a new user logs into a device they've never used before. My recommendation is actually to leave this off. Because in most cases, when a device is used by multiple users, the software is already installed and the policies, it'll receive the policies or it might've already received the policies or it'll receive them over time. Why the hell would you mess around with that? Turn it off for users that are just switching a lot. Uh, block device usage during setup is one I recommend to have on. Allow retry and allow reset is a personal choice. I like having them available always. It's I, I just like it. I'm, uh, I like being my, my admins being able to go like, oh, damn it, it lost its Wi-Fi connection. Let's try again. Oh, damn it, it lost something else. Let's try again. Um, allow user to use device setup if setup fails. I only enable this in very specific troubleshooting sequences. Please don't enable it by default because users will just click that button and will be missing half of their apps and then call you like, oh, no, you didn't install my laptop the way you promised you would, and they'll have all sorts of issues. So just don't enable that and tell them to call you when something goes wrong. Um, a recommendation, by the way, is to install on device level your Screen Connect instance. Because while the ESP is busy, you can use Screen Connect or any other remote control tooling, really, um, to control their screen and check out what exactly is going wrong. You can even start a device reset using Shift F12 and then System Reset. If you install that at device level, you can almost instantly access that device during. Um, a very important part of the ESPs is the timeouts in minutes. Um, this timeout has to be customized to the client. Don't assume that you can just say, oh, it's 15 minutes for everyone, because that's an assumption I made. But then we got a client that has four CAD packages they need to install. SolidWorks, AutoCAD, um, e EPM2, and another one. Those installations take an hour. So at that moment, you'll want to increase this timeout because it counts the device installations as a part of the timeout. Um, in general, my recommendation is to keep this nice and low. Keep this, um, try to install all of their applications on a virtual machine. Try to install their, their thing. You need to test their Intune environment anyway. Try to install it and see how long it runs. Does we have a couple of questions minutes? here. So, say 30 minutes. Okay, yeah. If you want to jump in, um, Kavanite mentioned that they use white glove, but it doesn't work every time it just stops an ESP. Do you have any suggestions? It stays on device setup endlessly. All managed app installations will sit on a zero by zero error. Um, so what's very important when you configure ESP is that you make sure that you only set up device stuff that needs to be set up on the device for it to function. Do only make applications mandatory at the moment that you really need them there to function. Otherwise, they can be installed after the ESP setup, and that makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot this kind of stuff. So first off, remove all your applications, only make the ones mandatory that you truly believe are mandatory. Because otherwise, you're going to be waiting for app installations where you're not sure what it's crashing on because you're installing so much at the same time. Um, if it's if it's hanging on the device setup, make sure that you also set up um, the scopes inside of your um, Intune to auto detect. Um, that is a uh, feature that is not currently available in SIP, but will be in either the next version or the one after that, where um, the URLs are set up correctly. Because a lot of times people forget that uh, autopilot, white glove, and all of these things require a little bit of setup by pressing what NDM scopes are available. Um, that you can find that in, and I'm doing this from the top of my head. So 
excuse me if, if I'm somewhat wrong, but it's endpoint management, devices, autopilot configuration, the first little card that's there, click on that and set the scopes to all for MDM. Um, don't do that for mobile app management. It's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's not always advised and it can slow down your device EFB, ESP if you're not using MAM. Okay, um, I think that answers More? that question. Yes. Um, and so next up, Woody wanted to know, will autopilot profiles and status pages be part of standards eventually? Good question. Um, currently, you can already deploy them to all clients using the all uh, option. I don't believe we ever plan for them to be standards. Um, that is something, if you'd like that to be done, Please create a feature request, even if you're not a sponsor right now. Um, feel free to create a feature request for that, and I'll check the amount of likes people give that, and I'll do it based on that, because I'm not sure if that is something that we really need, but if enough people say, yes, we need it, go, go right ahead. LJ um, Travis asked, how do you allow user ESP to be reliable for non-autopilot setups if I have no policy setups at all about 90% user ESP just timeout on part of the security policy baseline that it never properly explains. Yes. Um, so I was about to get to the subject of user ESP. Um, user ESP is something that I personally do not enable anymore. Um, the device ESP is important because the user needs to be, needs to know that the, we're installing their applications, their mandatory applications, and we're installing the stuff they need to work. But after that, we actually push a policy that disables user ESP. And we do that, we push that policy because user ESP is um, not as useful as one might expect. The policies will be received anyway. It might take five minutes, it might take 10 minutes, but they will be received because the device has been added. Device ESP has gone through. Um, I, don't, I don't enable it anymore. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just not something that, that we do anymore. Um, I think that might be the easier solution for you against these problems, but also remember that when ESP fails, it's because a check-in to Intune has failed. It hasn't downloaded something it is expected to download, and that could be something you're not expecting, like a compliance policy or a, uh, um, or a group policy that has a conflict. Check your Intune portal directly, not using SIP, but go to your Intune portal, check that specific device and see if the uh, if there are any, um, I think they're called collisions, I'm not sure, or conflicts, see if there's any conflicts that are applying to that specific device. If you see a conflict, it mean, that means that there's a problem during ESP as well, because when ESP detects that conflict, it doesn't resolve it, and it just fails. So that could be another solution for you. Um, yeah, two more questions. questions. Yeah. Um, okay. One, I'm not from Gary. I'm never sure to whether I should ask his questions or not. <laughs> um, but it sounds I'll, I'll legit. How how do conditional access or compliance policies affect the OOVE? Okay, good question, Gary. Um, <laughs> by default, um, conditional access. This is applied to the out-of-the-box setup. Microsoft actually recommends to exclude your um, um, uh, to exclude the Intune extension from your uh, conditional access policies and create a unique conditional access policies for the Intune extension itself. And that is because in, there are times you want to have exclusions from MFA or you want to use tab or you want to use something else. So create a separate policy specifically through the Intune app extension. Um, yes, that is through the app ID. The app ID is ca called something, um, um, I think there, there's something like um, Intune and uh, Intune extension, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you find, if you look for Intune, you find a specific um, um, thing to exclude. Is the documentation for those uh, CA exclusions? Certainly there are, Woody. I will be sharing those uh, right after this. Um, there is a there, there's a link that Microsoft has like hey create an exclusion and create a separate CA policy for intern enrollment. Thank you, Bobby. Um, very important. I, I want to stress this. 
create a separate policy. Don't just exclude. Don't 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 think of, oh, I'm done. I exclude it. It's 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 over. It's it's fixed. Create a separate policy, please. Don't don't mess around with your security. Okay, so I think um, we're through with questions, and I actually wanted to leave the last fifteen minutes, but I've been talking so much. I'm going to walk through um, um, two more um, um, things inside of SIP right now. Um, you are able to view the uh, autopilot, autopilot status pages, even if they're not created through SIP on the window for um, uh, status pages and the same for profiles. You're able to view the raw JSON for both uh, to be able to copy and paste this and change it and these kind of things. Um, that is the part in SIP that I can explain in about an hour uh, on how to use autopilot. Um, now I want to give the floor to everyone here and just ask questions about SIP in general, because that was something requested last time. I want to reserve these last 10 minutes just for random SIP questions. Feel free to zoom in on anything, whether it's Intune, autopilot related or anything else. Um, remember to tag Ash if you want to ask a direct question. I'm trying to keep my eyes on chat, but uh, it's, it's, yeah. Will you replace Chocolatey with Winget? Actually, we have both available. Um, if you go to applications right now, you'll see that we have at Choco app, at Winget, or at Store app. Store app is Winget. Um, you can add anything that is currently in the commercial Microsoft store or anything that is currently inside of the Winget default catalog. Um, Shoko will still exist. And no, I will not add brew red. No. Ooh, bunch coming in. Um, going back a bit, is the notification to the user from someone using a temporary access password configurable through SIP? Um, no, currently that is not um, um, available. Uh, that is something we've we've designed internally. Um, again, if you'd like that function, even if you're not a sponsor, feel free to create a feature request, uh, get a couple of upvotes, and I'll check if I can include that from now on. Are we going to be able to do anti-phishing, safe links, and safe attachment policies via SIP? Yes, eventually. Um, I'm saying yes. Um, I'm saying yes because I know there's APIs coming for it. There's not a lot available right now. There's only a couple of them. It's coming. Um, I can promise you a timeline for that. Any updates on the OneDrive URL blank issue? I believe it's a Microsoft issue. IRC. Yes. IRC. <laughs> yes. Microsoft has said that they have a solution available. Um, but it's it's uh, the deployment of this solution is is going uh, about as slow as it can get. So I'm sorry, there's no solution for it from Microsoft side. However, um, uh, recently uh, one of our contributors said, "Hey, why don't we start doing it in a different way?" Um, I've started exploring that different way again. Thank you, Hul. It, it's great to have you in the team. Um, it we're going to look for a different way to deploy these these uh, autopilot OneDrive URL stuff and to make sure that offboarding always works and these kind of things. When you have um, a million and a half CA policies, how would you manage the exclusions since they're all stacked? Do you have any recommendations? Uh, so this is something that my security officer is pissed at me about because I keep giving the recommendation to make sure to exclude everything and then create a separate policy and then create a separate policy and then create a separate policy. Um, it gets tough, it gets tough, um, especially if you're creating it in the way that we're creating it. Um, we have about 25 policies right now, something like that. Um, I'm not sure if what Bobby, it's, it's... Oh, sorry. Yeah. It, right. it, 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 it gets bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure what, with, but what Bobby was saying was a question or not, but he said Win32 packages in the store is in preview. Um, 
Oh, oh yes, of course. Yes, yes. No, that's a comment on the Winget. Um, okay. Winget is avail uh, now has Win32 packages available in uh, uh, their thing, so you're able to actually use Add Store app to add Win32 packages. That's true. Yes. Rob said he has a customer tenant in Australia, but he's in the UK. Is there any way to change timeouts to prevent errors for the Oz tenant when taking some actions? Um, I'd love to sit down with you and look at that because I do not have any clients in Australia and I want to see how that works. Cool. So take that one offline. Um, Cyber Moloch says, any chance that future deployment from Azure DevOps instead of GitHub will be made easier? No. I'm sorry. I'm 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 not going to invest in any time into that. Um, um I like our current deployment method using GitHub. I know that both, uh, uh, well, one or two of the contributors use um, Azure DevOps, and DevOps instead. Um, I think Gary does and someone else does. Um, Michael, Michael does. Um, if, you, if you need help, please just ask the community for support. I'm not going to make that any easier. I'm sorry. The current the current way of deploying is ideal for me and um, I like having only one part of support when it comes to deployment. Frank wants to know, did SIP add the ability to add users and or groups so we can use that in standard and leverage that for the policies throughout SIP? Um, we recently added the ability to add groups, dynamic groups and groups and add a user to that group. Um, we're adding groups to conditional access policies too. We currently did locations and something else. We're adding groups to that. There are a few, com there are a few topics about um, different integrations in the system. Do you want to talk a little bit about how integrations get built and prioritized in SIP? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's actually quite simple. Um, the reason why you're not paying for SIP or why you're only paying a small portion or for the, for the sponsorship and the hosting is because our application is vendor backed. The vendors use um, uh, or the vendors pay us to keep the application alive and to keep investing in the application. And that means that we are only integrating with vendors that are giving us the ability to, to keep developing SIP, that are paying us to make sure that we can uh, keep the application free for everyone, that I can still invest my time, that uh, some of the SIP CyberDrain employees can invest their time. Um, CyberDrain focuses on keeping the application free for all of you. But the only way we can keep the application free for all of you is by you approaching your vendors and asking them, hey, we want an integration with SIP and SIP only integrates with sponsors. Could you think about um, uh, could you think about sponsoring them? Could you talk to them? Um, for example, um, Ninja One was one of our first sponsors. They they all they started sponsorship at a lower level. Noticed people were starting to ask for specific integrations, and they went up to their extension level. We have different sponsorship levels where either you only show a logo inside of the app, or you only show or uh, get a mention in the release notes like desk director. But um, yeah, in, in, in the long term, um, our only way to keep surviving is by having our vendor sponsors and our vendor sponsors allow us to create integrations. So it's pretty much the, the, the only way that, that you get an integration is by convincing a specific vendor to sponsor us for that level. Now there are some exceptions, of course, because who knows? The, uh, a good example of that is one of our current sponsors. Uh, if you're looking at our extensions, Gradient has ticketing integration. So if you're a Gradient user, you can use any PSA you want with SIP. So there's, of course, some, some exceptions to that. Um, if you're able to get an automation provider, a partner to sponsor at a higher level, then they'll be able to uh, use SIP as their PSA, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's that's um, the best description I can give everyone. Um, we're actually going to create a little document inside of our docs that allows you to um, uh, that allows you to send a direct email that you can just copy and paste to uh, specific vendors and say like, "Hey, we want this." 
my request to all of you if you want um if you want your provider to integrate is keep it public ask them publicly on linkedin on their communities on places where other clients see that you're asking for it because any public discourse is more moving than any private email i think that's that's pretty much it awesome i see that bedbug eddie also asked i see dado in the list dado is currently only a logo sponsor so they're not an extension sponsor um that that's all i can say about that so if you want them to have or if you want that psa uh, or, or rmm integration you'll have to ask them about that are there any more questions Because we are at the top of the hour, and I mean, I don't. Oh, uh, Frank asked you a question, 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 but he tagged you on it. So where is that question? Uh, he said, "What did he say? Where is it?" Does SIP support M365 Multi Geo? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, there's, there's, there's no, uh, there's, there's no current uh, um, limitation in uh, uh, using Multi Geo together with SIP. Um, Alden asked if I enjoyed my cider. Alden, it's not a cider, it's a beer. It was sour, but it's good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, logo sponsorship used to be a $1,000. Um, I'm saying used to be because we recently changed our uh, pricing models. Our pricing models are somewhat private. Um, please have a vendor contact me if they want to, um, uh, if they want to know more about the sponsorships. Um, the current costs of SIP, that is actually really good. Um, or the current cost of uh, running Azure. Um, as I said, sponsorship is $99 for everyone. And that will always be the case. Actually, we're hoping to get more sponsors to decrease the price. That is something that I am hoping for so much. The moment that we get more sponsors, we're able to push the price down for all MSPs. I don't want you guys to, to uh, be uh, paying paying like 99 bucks. I want you to pay like 15 or 20 if it would be possible. But we currently don't have enough vendors or sponsors to do that. I want you all to be able to have the cheapest solution you could have with the most power you could have. Currently running it yourself outside of the sponsored model, which is $99 a month, is between 13 and $20 a month, depending on a couple of things. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the difference is if you configure specific alerts or uh, if you can pretty much your usage, your usage, if you have, uh, alerts configured, if you have, um, a million standards configured, if you have all this stuff configured, it might cost more. It, uh, the average is between 13 and $20 a month. And actually I just saw that Daniel Bullock just, uh, put his SIP resource, oh, sorry. Greybeard just put his um, um, uh, usage for this pre previous month. Wow, forty dollars a month. You, uh, Woody, I'm not sure if you're. I know that I'm right, Daniel, but I just didn't want to name you publicly. I'm sorry, um, Woody. I see that you are currently uh, having a higher usage. Please check if you are. Uh, running in run from package mode because that is a symptom of something being wrong, having that high cost. And if it's running slow, then please, yeah, check run from package mode. Um, we have to start rounding off, and I'm still seeing questions running in. If anyone wants to jump off, feel free to jump off. Next week, we will be returning with a SIP and SIP 
where uh, we might have a little demonstration by one of our contributors for something they've built inside of Halo PSA. If there are any other um, non-urgent stuff, keep asking questions. I'll hang around for about 10 more minutes, but we should be ending it right now. Um, you all uh, have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you for the next Sip and Sip next week. If you have ideas about what we should talk about, drop them in chat today, and we'll see if we can implement them in the next week's session. Um, I often feel like one hour isn't enough to deep dive on some of this content, but it is enough to scratch the surface and get you interested for it. So I hope I did that. I hope I made you interested, and let's make sure that we all keep succeeding together. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Okay, so Thank you. Now that, that, now that that's finished, let me see the question Dave said. Um, I know you have a lot of scripts out there, such as ones that access Office 365 and update IT glue. They can benefit from the secure app model. Are you open at all to implementing them inside of SIP? No. Uh, that is a very short answer. Those scripts um, don't run optimally. They have been created in a time where I focused on very different things. Um, but also they are created by a vendor that currently doesn't sponsor and i will not have vendors benefit from something that i've created unless they're helping our community at large as well um i, I don't mind that the scripts exist right now they involve effort by the msp to implement um, i'd rather have someone pay the MSPs to implement those and make sure that our product stays as it should be. So no, not going to happen. I'm sorry. Um, Daniel, uh, you said yours is running slow too, but I blame it on setup from day one. Um, that might actually be a part of it because we changed storage accounts. We changed a lot of stuff. I would really recommend doing a reset up just it's it's there's been so many changes over time i think that um one of our developers one of our primary developers john actually um um john has done a lot with his instance and he's still running what was the original sip uh v1 so he doesn't experience that you might i would just suggest changing it Kevin asked, Defender for Office 365 standard presets, working on it, working on it. <laughs> Bobby wanted to know, um, have we talked to Hoodoo at all? Hoodoo is one of our sponsors. Uh, Hoodoo is one of our release sponsors. Um, I'd love to talk to them. Um, like I said, keep asking your vendors for it. Keep telling them like, hey, we want integrations. Um, do it publicly, do it on LinkedIn, tag me, tag Cyberdrain, tag the vendor and ask them. Like I said, public questions move a lot more than just, um, um, public questions move a, make a lot more movement and make a lot more noise than just sending them a private email to an account manager. Um, Matthew asked if we will put the SIP drink recipe on the dashboard going forward. That's actually a very nice idea, Matt. I might be doing that. Oh, Lewis just recommended something that I completely forgot doing, um, how to package in tune apps. Um, yeah, that would be a fun one to do in Sip and Sip as well. Is there some way? Wow, still a lot of questions. Okay. Um, do you have a community location for sharing policies for Sip, like catalog CA policies? No, we don't. It's a nice thought. Um, it's something we should look into. Um, is there is there or will there be a way to create conditional access policies that tar target the group template? Yes, working on it. Um, expect next release or the one after um did the contributor t-shirts get made actually that's something that we were discussing just yesterday um working on it we're trying to find a way for you not to have to give us your contact information and to just click on a link that's the only blocker right now i think we found a good party that that does that the contributor t-shirts and the uh, uh linkedin review t-shirts are on their way
Is the next CTF still planned for early 2024? Yes, it is. Will Ninja One be coming to add MSP app in the future? Yes. Um, oh, maybe. I can't say. No comment. Um, okay. So, like, I already said yes now, so everyone already understands that it might be coming. Um, this is a project by one of my dear friends, Gavin. Uh, he's trying to find a solution for that. Um, he's one of the product manager managers at Ninja One. I can't promise anything on their side. I can't. But my friends are trying to achieve something for you. And I'm not sure if it's going to happen. I'm not sure how it's going to happen. But we're looking into a generic installer or some way to have um, um, some way to have it inside of SIP. Um, we're working on it, really. Uh, coming to Vegas for Ride of Boom 2024? Yes, I am, Tanner. Yes, I am. Actually, I'm coming there, and it is my birthday. Scott is now going like, why did you say this? <laughs> Probably maybe soon. That's, yeah. I'm sorry if I spoiled anything, guys. Okay, all right. Now, I think we're officially done. These were all the questions. Um, if anyone has any more questions, always feel free to chat to me inside of SIP General. Um, I'm no longer going to answer this, the questions in this chat. So Bobby, please move that to the dev channel. Yes, it is. Um, but it's more complex than just having an, a packager. It's, I'll, I'll explain the limitations. Um, Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day, evening, night, wherever you are. And remember to have fun. Bye, everyone.